All right, so if you've just bought your new Instant Pot Duo home and are wondering how to use it, we've got a great how-to video to help get you started. So, hi, I'm Jen. And I'm Barbara. And we're with Pressure Cooking today. Today we've got a fancy duo. This is the R2-D2 duo from uh, William Sonoma. It's exclusive to them, and I couldn't resist getting it. We love Star Wars growing up. It's right, so it's got some fun colors in this fun wrap, but the buttons and that are all the same as the classic mm -hmm. duo. Yeah. We first made an Instant Pot Duo video in 2014 with like the original duo and the, the button terminology was a little bit different. So this is the duo I have that has the updated language, the updated kind of functionality. So we wanted to demo on this one today. So let's start talking about the housing. Okay, yeah, parts and assembly. So you've got your pressure cooker together and it's made up of several parts. You've got your lid, you've got your stainless steel interior pot, and then you've got this wonderful thing that's called the housing. This is where the magic happens. You've got the kind of the sensor plate down here where that heats up and allows it to come to pressure. So the most important thing to remember about your housing is? Always cook in the inner pot. Yes, so like some people will leave just like a wooden spoon across the top to remind them, hey, um, there's no inner pot in here. Don't dump the water directly yeah. in. So if, if you were to dump the water in here, it would just run out the bottom. So you got to make sure you're always cooking in the inner pot. Always. So um, we'll I'll just put that in. Uh, the stainless steel pot, it's, um, the Instant Pot comes with this nice stainless steel. It's got a nice thick bottom. As you can see, the bottom is slightly domed. Um, so that when you add like butter or your oil when you saute, it kind of runs to the side. So you just kind of pick it up and swirl it around. It sits just right inside real nice. Right, yeah, so don't be afraid. You might need some hot pads to, to lift it up and out of the pot to swirl it. Or if it's sauteing too hot, yeah. sometimes I'll just lift it up because the heating element is right on the bottom. And so... It just works like a pot on the stove top. If it's cooking too hot, you lift it up a little ways from the heating element. So we've got that. Um, next, we've got the ring, or the, your, your lid. We'll talk about the top of the lid first. So on your lid, you have um, your sealing and uh, venting. We call this your pressure release valve. The, the steam releases out of this top, just mm -hmm. comes shooting right out on a quick release. Yep, and then you've got this little guy right here, your float valve. It goes up and down. When there's enough pressure inside the pot, the float valve will um, rise up and will seal up. So see how it has a little bit wide um, area the on the lid yeah it fits with this wide area of the and you'll notice pot. the front of the lid has little arrows on it so you just put that in there and then turn it to close it and as you're watching along the back there's a little um a little pin that sticks out that um you see as it's locking in place or unlocking all right and you have to have the lid locked in place for it to start pressure cooking. Yep. So then let's talk about the underside of the lid now. Um, so this is the underside of the lid. It's got that little float valve. It's got a little mini silicone gasket on it. Um, that does come off. You just pull it right off and wash it. You take the float valve out and wash it. And then I always like to put it right back on my right back on. Keep it in nice and tight. Snaps on. And then you've got this. Um, it's on newer models. It's a little bit tight, hard to get out. There's a couple of ways you can pop it off. You can just put a little butter knife under the edge. My favorite tool though is this little like chair that goes on the bottom of your chair leg. You can get it at Home Depot for like a buck. Yeah. Um, and you just push it in place right on top of your clog valve. Anti-block shield. <laughs> Anti-block shield. So you just push it in place and it comes right off. And it comes out pretty easily. I always take off the anti-block shield when I'm washing it and I take this float valve out. So I put my finger here to hold it up and then that just comes off and then you can just drop the pin out and the same way it goes back together so like that and, and I always take those off yep. to clean it. and then that just snaps back on yep. and it gets a lot easier to take off after yeah after that, a couple times this is it. fairly new so it, it's pretty stiff now the other important thing is the silicone gasket. You always have to have the silicone gasket yeah. in place before you cook. Yep. Um, I, if you have it so it's on but not all the way on, you're going to get steam leaking out of this the side, side um, anywhere where it's not on. So I like to just take it, push it down, go around it the whole way with my thumb, and just make sure you can see it fitted nice and tightly in place. When it's in place, you can see it's 
all the way around. It's tucked under. It doesn't have any bulbs or bunches. See how this kind of sits up higher over here? Just push it right in place. Does that look good? And then when you want to take it off, you just grab hold of it and pull it right out. So a lot of questions we get is how to clean the ceiling rings. Sometimes when you're cooking really fragrant foods like, I don't know, like onions, uh, onions, anything with uh, sesame oil in it or rice vinegar in it. Um, chili powder. Chili powder. It'll take on the flavor of what you're cooking. So I like to have one ceiling ring for sweet foods, like cheesecakes, kind of those more mild foods, still cut oats, and then another one for um, like those savory foods that are gonna take on a lot of smell. Um, we have tried so many methods to get these ceiling rings to not, to lose their smell. We've washed them in the dishwasher, we've put them out in the sun for a couple hours, we have done lemon juice and baking soda, we baked them in the oven at low temperatures. These are all things that people say get the smell out. For me personally, all of them help, but none of them get rid of it completely. So if there's a method you love, go for it. But for me, the best method is just to have extra ceiling rings on hand. And I like to store my pot upside down and the ceiling ring just sort of airs out. It can take, I mean, depends on while you were cooking, but it can take a week or so before the smell finally fades. But. We, have a, we have a smaller pantry. Um, and so we started when we first got married, we would um, put them in little Ziploc bags and just seal them up so that my kitchen didn't smell like all the things. But again, whatever works best for you. Right. So um, next, should we talk about the saute button? Yes. Oh, let's just talk about the buttons in general. Okay. So as you can see, we've got a lot of buttons on here. Um, there's a zillion presets all along the side. You've got soup, broth, meat stew, beef, chili, poultry. So say you want to cook like a chicken soup. We get that question a lot, like what button do I use? Do I use soup? Do I use poultry? Do I use meat? And the answer is, is that all of these preset buttons just run a preset cook time. The people at Instant Pot said, okay, the average chicken weighs this much and it should take about this long to cook. And so when you push that button, it just runs a preset cook time. It doesn't change the cook temperature and it doesn't have a sensor inside the pot to tell when your chicken is done. It doesn't know if your chicken is diced up into small bits and needs a small cook time or if you put a whole frozen chicken in there. It doesn't know, it just runs the same preset cook time every time. Right, so we prefer just to use the pressure cook button. Yes, so if you're overwhelmed with all these buttons on there, just feel free right now to just ignore them. Follow a trusted recipe, use um, the pressure cook button and the saute button. Those are the two buttons you need to get like 99% of the things you're gonna cook done in here. So um, we've got the saute button just right here. When you push it, it comes on. And then you have to wait a minute. Don't push anything. When you wait a minute, it will eventually beep. Eventually. <laughs> Someday. There we go. So I like to wait until it says hot before I add my oil, mm -hmm. especially if I'm browning a meat. Uh, you want to get this pot pretty hot before yeah. you add your oil. You don't want your oil to scorch while it's in the pot. Sometimes I'll add my butter a little bit before it reads hot just because I want to get it started melting. Right, especially if you're sauteing or onion or something. Then, yeah, just add And that it. works good. So you can also change the, um, the, the heat level. Heat level, yep. yep. Little. So it, it has three levels. It has less, normal, and more. Yep. 99% of the time I just cook on normal. You often go up to high when you're doing meats, Yeah, right? if I'm browning meats and I want to get a really good sear, mm -hmm. I'll make sure to put it on high and then let it heat up. I often just forget to do that. And <laughs> so I do most of my stuff on normal. So the saute function is great for browning and sauteing, but it's also great for thickening sauces after you've pressure cooked. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll often do a cornstarch slurry mm -hmm. after it's pressure cooked, and then you'll use the saute button to thicken that sauce. Some of our older recipes on the site use the terminology you know, simmer, because before the Instant Pot existed, there was another pressure cooker, and that was the terminology they used. So if you see simmer, just now press the saute button. If you see browning, press the saute button. That right. is your go-to. Often on simmer, I'll do saute less, and yep. I just never adjust it. <laughs> Do what works best for you. And then one more thing we wanted to mention, when you're cooking in saute mode, you always leave the lid off. You just like a pot on the stove, you wanna leave it uncovered so you can see that butter melt, so you can watch the meat as it browns, so you can stir the onions as needed. Yeah, if, if the lid was on, it would just steam the meat instead of brown it. So be sure you leave the lid off. Okay, so the next button you need to know about is the magic button. It's where all the magic happens. It's the pressure cook button. On older models of the Duo, if you have an older model, it will read manual. Um, I think as Instant Pot kind of became bigger, 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 they wanted to clarify some of the terminology they used. 
So the newer, newer, so, so the, the newer new, duo, the new duos <laughs> have um, a button called pressure cook. Yep. So when you when you hit the pressure cook button, um, it automatically comes up to a preset cook time um, or whatever one you use last. So you hit the pressure cook button and you press the plus or minus button to select your specified cook time. Say we're 10 minutes, sure. So, and then you, again, you wait. The duo does not have a start button, so you'll need to just wait for the beep and that'll let you know it's cooking. But however, before you um, push that pressure cook button, you wanna make sure your lid is in place. You always, always, always lock the lid in place with your pressure cooker. So again, always check for three things. First, check and make sure that your still pot is in your pressure cooker. Then check to make sure that you have enough liquid. Um, for This is a six quart duo and the average recommended amount is about a cup. With some ingredients you can use less, like with... With, with something like um, chicken or something that's gonna release a yeah, lot of liquid berries. as it cooks. Yep. But so again, follow a trusted recipe, especially at the beginning, and it, it'll lead you right. So we've just got a cup of water. I'm gonna pour in there. Oh, it's hot. We're in the saute setting. Okay. And then um, got our gasket in place. Got my swirling ring is in place. Lock the lid in place. And then make sure the lid is turned to the sealed position. You get a lot of questions about this. It's loose and wobbly, and that's normal. That's what you expect. You just always want it to sealing when you're cooking venting to release the pressure. So we've got it to ceiling. Okay, so now we'll press our pressure cook button and adjust our cook time and let it come to pressure. All right, so after you've pressed the pressure cook button, adjusted your cook time and you hear a beep, you see the display reads on. It's gonna stay it on until that float valve rises up and the pressure inside the pot reaches an internal temperature. Sometimes the float valve will rise up and it won't, won't change to the cook time yet. That just means it's not reached pressure inside. Yeah, it's close, but not quite. So if you have a big pot of soup with cold ingredients, it could take up to 20 minutes for mm -hmm. it to come up to pressure. So just be patient. It's, it's important if, if you've never used a pressure cooker before to do that water test, to, to put that water in there and just see how it works. So all you're doing is basically boiling water, bringing water to pressure, and that's really important. It just helps you get familiar with your machine. If you're one of those types that just likes to jump right on in, go for it. But again, our advice, follow a trusted recipe when you're just getting started. So right now our pressure cooker is coming to pressure and you can see that float valve is kind of rising and falling a little bit and a little bit of steam is coming out from where that float valve is. That is normal. You need enough steam in the pot, there it goes, to pop that pressure cooker valve right up to where it needs to be. To seal pressure and you can see that the pot still reads on it hasn't quite hit the correct internal pressure yet but it's really close you won't want to see any steam coming out around the edges you'll just want to see the steam coming up from here if you ever do see steam coming out from around the edges immediately hit cancel um, release the pressure if there's any in there and take the lid off it will be steamy it will be hot it will be drippy but you're not going to get good results while steam's coming out the side you just aren't and Usually the problem is the gasket is not in place properly, so you just want to adjust your, jas <laughs> adjust your gasket, reinstall it, lock the lid back in place, and try again. And if it's hot, that's what those little mini mitts are for. They're really great for that. All right, so the pressure cooker beep. It is done, and as you can see, the display switched to an L. Um, that, the L stands for lapsed. We get a lot of questions like, I set my cook time for three minutes, and now all of a sudden my display reads like 10 minutes. But that L in front just tells you how much time has lapsed, how much time has passed since the pressure cooker's cook time cycle stopped. And it starts to count up for you. This is a really nice feature. Um, if you're busy, like your kids are crazy and you're trying to get other things prepped for dinner, um, it's nice to just be able to look at that and say, oh, okay, it's been five minutes or, oh, okay, it's been 10 minutes. Yeah, I used that feature a lot when I had to go pick up the kids from sports or whatever. And I could just leave it on the keep warm setting and go. Yep. Okay, so now that the cook time has ended, you will be directed by your recipe um, to release the pressure. There's a couple different ways you can release the pressure. The first is a quick pressure release, and that's when you turn the uh, pressure release valve from sealing to venting, and um, it will immediately release a big jet of steam. It's loud, it's exciting. This is kind of what people think about. If you're nervous, like I was when I first started cooking, you can use a long wooden spoon to get you far away from that valve when you start. Um, at this point, I just am used to it now. Yes. The main thing to remember is the steam will come up out of the top, so you want to keep your hand low. You don't want your face out. over it. That would be yeah. bad. You don't want like under any like pendant lights or 
kitchen cabinets. You want to make sure it's turned away to vent away from that. And the other option is a natural pressure release, which means basically you leave it here. You do absolutely nothing until the float valve drops on its own. It is slowly releasing pressure. Um, and eventually the float valve will just unlock the pressure will be released yeah. and it will go. You cannot open the lid until this float valve drops. Yeah. It's, it's, it's locked, locked tight and you, you shouldn't even don't, try. Don't try this at home, kids. Okay. <laughs> so we'll release the pressure. Yeah, let's do a quick pressure release okay. now. All right, and you see that float valve drop. That means that your pressure cooker can now be unlocked. So you twist it to unlock and then keep in mind, um, it will- oh, the, It's hot steam. Yes, so you wanna open it away from your face, let the steam out. Um, I like to kind of wiggle it to get the drips off. And then you see these little fins on the edge, they fit perfectly into the slots on either side. Just keeps your lid out of the way. Um, I use that sometimes. Other times when the kids want to help with cooking, I just go put it in the sink to get the hot stuff away from them. One other part that we wanted to mention was the condensation cup. This is a little cup that just slides into place on the back of the pressure cooker. For the most part, it doesn't fill up. For most of the things I cook, I don't see it fill up. But if you're making soups or something that's got a lot of oil or foaming, um, it's got a little tiny hole at the top. Some of the liquid will just collect here in this. Um, rim and it can drain down in the condensation cup. But usually, you know, we don't have any condensation for it to, to um, fill up with. Right. So, but that's just one thing that you need to be aware of. We, we get, get questions like, about it. Right. What is this for? So. Um, okay. So another thing to talk about is the keep warm button. Um, this button is usually like it's just the default. And what it does is it runs the heating element at a low temperature to keep your food warm while you, um, while you wait. Right. And it will cycle on and off just like a stove to maintain a low temperature. Um, people often ask, does it take longer for the pressure to release if we have the keep warm setting on? And it's absolutely the same. The heat on the keep warm setting will not turn on until the temperature inside the pot has dropped low enough. And so that will be after pressure has been released. Um, for me, the keep warm setting is more of a, I will serve the family up, we'll go down and eat, and then I'll come back to my rice and a little bit has been like dried out on the bottom because I just left it in the pot with the keep warm setting on for like an hour. So I often will just unplug it when I am done cooking so I don't forget. You can also push the keep warm button to um, turn it off if there's a little light above it that will indicate whether it's on or off. So right. You if if well. you know before you start cooking that you don't want it to go to keep warm, yeah. then you turn it off before you start the cooking. Okay, so we talked a little bit about a natural pressure release mm -hmm. and a quick pressure release, but there's also an intermittent release. Yep, and that one is like if you're cooking foods at foam or like a pasta where if you start to see a little bit of water coming out here is okay, a couple little tiny water bubbles is okay. Oh, sorry, out here is fine. But if you start seeing foam or food, like little food particles come out spitting. Yeah, you never want to see that. So you'd immediately turn it from venting to sealing. Yep. And then um, like if you're cooking pasta, you don't want it to overcook. So you would- Wait a couple seconds. Yeah, and then just go back to venting. If, if fluid starts to come out, close it up and just do that back and forth until all the pressure is released. So we call that an intermittent release. It's just kind of another way to do it for foods that foam applesauce. Um, we also combine the releases, um, so you kind of get the benefits of a natural pressure release, but you don't have to wait however long for the pot to cool off. So a lot of our recipes, like for rice, we'll have you cook for three minutes, and then um, have you allow the pressure to release naturally for seven minutes before you do a quick pressure release to release any remaining pressure. That just helps you control how long the recipe's gonna take. Mm -hmm. And it allows any foaming in the pot to die down um, before you release the pressure, but then you don't have to wait the full amount of time. So most of our recipes, often we do a 10 minute natural release and then quick release right. just to part, get going. Part of the reason you're pressure cooking is because you want it to be fast and you want to be out of the kitchen quick. And so that's why we often do that. Yeah. So um, going forward, if you have any questions um, on our website, pressurecookingtoday.com, we have a ton of resources to help beginner cooks. We have um, an explainer we have if you sign up for our email list we have a uh, ebook that goes into great detail about the things we covered in the video today if you like it printed off so you can reference it we have that available 
Um, several times a year, we teach a cooking course for beginning Instant Pot users, so I'll put a link to that in the description below. And be sure and like and subscribe. Thanks so much for joining us.